worshipping because as we welcome you into the house of the Lord, we've already welcomed our Lord Jesus Christ and we are to conduct ourselves in the manner that we are in his presence this morning. The other thing too, I'd like to welcome our dear friend from England, Terence. Terry, it's nice to have you with us this morning. We have a sister visiting from Australia and with her friend from Wellsford. So it's great to have these people and it's good to see our young people coming back to church after the holidays and it's amazing how they grow and develop in the holiday time. They must have been all eating sanitarium products down at camp, I don't know. But they're looking all healthy and well this morning. Praise the Lord. You'll notice the message in the, in the record that there's a, a new record out, a new facelift model. Unfortunately, it hadn't arrived for today, so we'll see that, so that, see that one next week. And there's really great joy in the camp this morning when we know that eight people have been dedicated to, uh, for baptism next Sabbath. A high day in the kingdom of God because the angels will be celebrating the fact that these eight people have dedicated their lives and indicated that they want to be part of the Lord's remnant church. So we have a lot to be thankful for and I'd like you to pray sincerely for those people this week. It's amazing, Pastor Webster and I have been visiting these people and uh, again, I praise the Lord that he has sent us a man of Pastor Webster's calibre. He is filled with the Holy Spirit and he sincerely wants to spread the gospel message here in Wangarei. And it's been a joy to see the emotions of these people that we've visited with, the fact that they've come to know Jesus Christ as their personal saviour. Um, and that is a joy in itself, amen. So uh, please invite as many people as you can for next week's celebration. And uh, we also have a potluck, uh, potluck lunch, so uh, all are welcome to attend that. My, the, uh, the worship um, person this, morning, this week asked me, what, what is your title? And I don't normally have a title for my uh, sermon. However, I have chosen one for this one, and it's called Faithful. Faithful. And... Uh, it's interesting to note that the word faithful is actually made up of two words, faith and full. So when we take this word apart, faith and full, or if we turn it around, it means full of faith, doesn't it? Or yeah, full of faith. The noun, the word faith, is our belief in God, our trust, our loyalty, our belief, or what we believe in. And the adjective, the word full, meaning holding all it can, in abundance, complete, perfect, ample, etc. It's so full, you can't add any more to it, and that's how our faith should be, faithful. So if we take it again a bit apart, we have the faith and the full, using those words that describe the word faithful, we have trust abundantly, Loyalty completely or complete loyalty. We have belief, ample or ample belief, or belief perfect, perfect belief. However, the word faithful by itself is different as one word. It is the way we practice our faith by showing or presenting our faith by trustworthiness and accurately displaying or expressing our faith. Faithful is our way of also allowing our faith to overflow by outward expression through example and compassion to others around us both in the church and outside the church. The pivotal placement of the Sabbath commandment anchoring us in a faithfulness to God and our neighbour. Faithful also equates with the word obedience and yet again, faithful is our visible expression of simply being faithful. Faithful also stands along the title of stewardship. And naturally, stewardship not only includes our faithfulness in finance regarding tithing, but also in our time, our health, and our outreach. Our time, are we faithful in our time in devoting our daily study to God in, in his word? Are we faithful in our health and looking after the temple of the Holy Spirit? Are we faithful in our outreaching by 
practicing the commission that Jesus gave us. And it's a blessing. We have many, many faithful saints here in the Wangare body of believers to whom if it wasn't because of their faithfulness, we would not be here this morning. They know who they are, and I personally pay tribute to those people because today I have a home to worship my God in. They also have not only been faithful in tithe and offering over the years, but uh, with their time and spiritual gifts of teaching our Sabbath school classes and organising our music and worship services, this morning we acknowledge them and I personally say thank you. And it's a privilege to be flanked by two elders that have been faithful over the years in looking after God's church here in Wangarei. All through the Bible, both old and new, we find the faithful servants of God. But before I go there, I'd like to show a picture this morning of true faithfulness, if you could flip that up. Here we have a lady from the Haiti earthquake, where obviously they've lost everything, and here they are in a camp. And here she is, being faithful and studying her Bible, reading her Bible. But do you notice something else about that picture? What's lying on the ground in the front here? Her Sabbath school lesson. That's faithfulness in a time of tragedy. Faithfulness in a time of loss. Are we that faithful in our daily walk, even though we haven't experienced any devastation to this level or magnitude? So all through the Bible, both old and new, we find the faithful servants of God. Elijah, Abraham, Moses, Daniel, David, Samuel, and so it goes on right through to the writer of Revelation, John. But the faithful person I admire and would like to draw attention to this morning is Joseph, youngest son of Jacob and otherwise known as Zathnapaniah. Joseph, the dreamer, as known by his brothers, youthful son of Jacob, who became prime minister of Egypt. He became prime minister, governor of Egypt, well, without even running an expensive, time-consuming election campaign. This was not an election, but a selection as one of the most faithful men of Israel. We begin the story already in the first book of Moses in Genesis chapter 37. And if we could all turn there and we'll go just slowly through this story because it is amazing to see literally how faithful Joseph was. And reading from verse 1 in the book of Genesis chapter 37, it says, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. Verse 2, These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years of old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Joseph brought to his father their evil report. One might think that young Joseph was telling tales about his brothers or his cousins, just to keep in his father's Jacob's good books, perhaps. But he was so loved by his father, Jacob, that it wasn't necessary for him to tell, tell tales out of school, as we say. No, Joseph was faithful in reporting to his father because the Bible tells us that the report was evil. An evil report. If then evil, it was not a tell, tell, tale story, sorry. No. They were sinning against God and their father, Jacob, being the head of the family and tribe. The report was that they were involved in fornication and that Joseph knew that they were transgressing against their God and also their father. In verse, <coughs> excuse me, in verse 3, we read, Now Israel, Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his children because he was a son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colours or of many pieces. You know, when, when you are loved by someone and you in turn love them too, you are faithful to that person as also we too are in a marriage. God loves us so much more and that should be our natural response to faithfully abiding in him. 
Our story then goes on to tell that Joseph was also puzzled by his dreams and he told his brothers and father about them. This in turn only fueled their hatred against him to the extent that they no longer spoke to him peaceably. Jealousy is harmful. It causes one to speak unfavorably about people and about others. Picking the story back up in verse 7 and verse, uh, till verse 9, it says, For behold, we are binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood around about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. They bowed down to him. And then his father rebuked him. And it says in verse 10, And he told to his fathers and to his brethren, His father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and my, thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee on earth? Yep, here we have Joseph declaring his dreams to his families and they did not discern them to be prophetic dreams in the way God would save this race of people. Jacob worried about his sons also. The story goes on to say his sons were out tending the flocks and Joseph being worried about them in Shechem after not receiving any word or report. He sends Joseph to inquire about how they are. In verse 18, uh, we pick up the story again. And it says, When his brothers, when they saw him afar off, even before he came near to them, they conspired against him to slay him. And when they saw him, the devil had come into these men and conspired them to, and conspired them to kill their brother. The parallel to Christ's life, as we see in Joseph's life, is also how Satan plotted to kill the Saviour at every moment he could, especially before Jesus came to the cross. Reading on from verse 20 to 22. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him, cast him into some pit. And he will say, some evil beef, beast has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben, his brother, said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that it is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. So here we have uh, Reuben trying to save his brother, as Peter also tried to save the master, our Lord, by cutting the ear off the guard. Reuben here plans to protect his brother so that he too can free him later. In verse 23, and it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colours that was on him. Another very significant parallel. They stripped Joseph of his coat just as the soldiers had stripped Jesus of his cloak. This special coat of colour or pieces was that one that would normally be worn by a person of distinction in this time and in this culture. Joseph here was representing Jesus, our Lord, the one of distinction. The hand of God, though, is upon Joseph. Reading from verse 27 to verse 28. Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. Then there passed the Midianites and merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver and they brought Joseph unto Egypt. Here we have a similarity or a distinction also where Joseph is put into the pit as our saviour was put into the grave. Joseph was lifted out, our saviour rose out of the grave. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Was it inflation? No, I don't think so. It is just symbolising that Jesus is, much more, is worth much more and he was bought with a very high price. Reading from verse uh, 32 to 35, our story goes on. 
And it says, And they sent the coat of many colours, and they brought it to their father, and said, This have we found. Know not whether it be the son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and, sackcloth, and uh, put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down into the grave unto, unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept. Jacob's grief was enormous, and they were not able to comfort him. Their selfish act had nearly brought their father to an early grave. A father simply mourns his son. God the Father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The grief of our heavenly father is minutely mirrored by that of Jacob's loss. Can we at all even begin to comprehend the sacrifice of a loving heavenly father? The angels in their multitudes, were they able to comfort the God in his loss? A heavenly father who has given you and me the greatest gift of all, his son, the saving creator of all things, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our story goes on and records how Joseph was sold to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh. So here we have Joseph going from the, uh, the way of life that he was living in in tents and in the desert, and he comes into the house of Potiphar, an extension of the palace of Pharaoh. And we go over now to verse uh, 39, uh, chapter 39, sorry, and just reading from verse 2 onwards to 4. And we just have a confirmation here, and it says, Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down to them. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and then he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had put into his hand. And the Lord was with Joseph. Our great author, Mrs. Ellen White, wrote in her book, of March 11, 1897, God's Representatives, she said it was God's design that through Joseph, Bible religion should be introduced among the Egyptians. This faithful witness was to represent Christ in the courts of kings. Through dreams, God communicated with Joseph in his youth, giving him an intimation of the high position that he would be called to fill. The brothers of Joseph, to prevent the fulfillment of his dreams, sold him as a slave. But their cruel act resulted in bringing about the very thing the dreams had foretold. Those who seek to turn aside the purposes of God and oppose his will may appear for a time to prosper. But God is at work to fulfill his own purpose and he will make manifest who is the ruler of the heavens and the earth. Joseph regarded his being sold into Egypt as the greatest calamity that could ha have befallen him. But he saw the necessity of trusting in God as he had never done when protected by his father's love. Joseph saw the necessity of being faithful to God. Joseph brought God with him into Egypt and the fact was made apparent by his cheerful demeanour amid his sorrow, uh, uh, sorry, and amid his sorrow, as the ark of God brought rest and prosperity to Israel, so did his, this lo uh, loving God. God-fearing youth bring a blessing to Egypt. This was manifested and so marked in a manner that Potiphar, in whose house he served, attributed all his blessings to his purchased slave and made him a son rather than a servant. It is God's purpose that these who love and honour his name shall be honoured also themselves. And we also saw that in our Sabbath school in regards to kindness. And that the glory given to God through them shall be reflected upon themselves. Joseph's character did not change when he was exalted to a position of trust. 
He was brought where his virtue would shine in distinct light in good works. The blessing of God rested upon him in the house and in the field. All the responsibilities of Potiphar's house were placed upon him, and in all this he manifested steadfast integrity, for, for he loved and feared God. Feared God, sorry. Trusting and trust, faithful and faithfulness. We'd like to pick up our, uh, our story again in uh, verse uh, 7 to 9, and this is where the trouble starts. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater, greater in this house than I. Neither hath he not kept anything back from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph was faithful to his master as he was to God. Because you are his wife, how could I do this wickedness? Adultery and fornication is the sin against God and our neighbour. The parallel to the life of Christ is that he was tempted in all points as we are and yet sinned not. And uh, just turning over to the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 15, we have a wonderful confirmation of that. Just keep your finger in, in the book of Genesis, we'll come back to that. But in, here in the book of Hebrews, verse 15, it says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as like we are yet without sin. And the same was with Joseph. He was tempted and yet he did not sin. Because of his faithful connection to God, Joseph was able to resist the prompting of Potiphar's wife. His brothers lied about him, and now Potiphar's wife lies about him. In the judgment hall, they lied about Christ too, and they crucified him. And the whole time in our story here, Joseph retains his innocence. Reading, picking up the story again in verse 20 and moving on to 23. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisons were bound, and he was there in the prison. Potiphar's wife lied that Joseph laid with him, and laid with her, sorry. And uh, he, she told this story to her, to her husband, and he believed her and threw Joseph in prison. Joseph had served Potiphar for 11 years, and now he was going to spend the next two years in jail. In prison, Joseph continue, continues his role. Instead of being in control of Potiphar's house, he is now put in charge of the prison. God continues to bless Joseph. Chapter 40 uh, records the story of two of Pharaoh's officers that had also been cast into prison. We know the story about the butler and the baker, how they were cast into prison, and they also had a dream, uh, had dreams, and they were very sad because of their dreams because nobody could interpret them. And in ver chapter 40, reading from verse 8, and they said unto them, uh, oh no, sorry, we'll pick up the story in verse uh, 7, where Joseph says, and he said, ask Pharaoh's officers, that were with him in the ward of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? And they said unto them, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. Joseph again gives God the glory and declares that all knowing God that we serve interprets dreams. So Joseph was able to interpret and relate the dream, the meaning of the dream to them. In, uh, in verse 12, and it's interesting to note, however, that when Joseph had the dream, he did not interpret his dream to his family, and it was most probably because they were so obvious. But as the dreams of the butler and the baker are fulfilled, God is preparing the way for his plan to be full, fulfilled also. In verse, um, sorry, in verse 41, 
Uh, we have it there. Oh, sorry, in chapter, chapter 41. So much detail is given in this chapter relating to the dreams of Pharaoh and how the chief butler uh, relays to Pharaoh that Joseph is the only one that can interpret them. So if we go down to verse um, 15 and 16 of chapter 41. And we have Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream and there is none that can interpret it. Interpret it. And I heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answering Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. The same Pharaoh that had asked this question of Joseph would have known who he was, because only two years had elapsed since he was in prison. Again, God is glorified by Joseph's statement that it is not by him but that God will give him an answer of peace. What a comforting answer he gives Pharaoh here. In other words, he says to Pharaoh, he says, don't, don't be disturbed by your dreams. God's got everything under control. Pharaoh then goes on to describe his dreams, and Joseph explains their meaning in detail. Joseph has a relationship with his God. Throughout all this time in trials in Egypt, Joseph remains faithful to God and the Egyptians he serves. Picking up our story in chapter 41, verse 37 and 46. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. So Joseph related the interpretation of the dreams to Pharaoh. Uh, Pharaoh was happy with it. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one of, of the, as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand, put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in the vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had, which he had and they cried before him, bow the knee, and he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Safna Pa'anya. And he gave him to wife Asana, the daughter of Potiphera, the priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. What a wonderful story this one is. Here we have a Hebrew Lad is honoured to the most highest position next to the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh. Joseph is re rewarded for being faithful to his God and allowing God to use him for this purpose. Verse 42, Joseph receives another cloak of fine Egyptian linen. His old cloak is replaced. This cloak is because of his distinction as ruler over Israel the other one represented Jesus. Joseph receives his uh, Egyptian name, Zafna Pa'anya, which translated means simply man of food during famine. Asana, the daughter of Potiphera, the priest, becomes his wife. Verse 46, Joseph was 30 years of age when he began his work in Egypt. Jesus was 30 years of age as he began his ministry in this fallen world. As the prophetic dreams of Pharaoh began to unfold, Joseph worked the first seven years collecting the grain and storing it in every city throughout Egypt. Can you imagine the logistics of all this throughout the whole land of Egypt? It also says in, in one of the verses, not in this translation, but in another one, it says there was so much grain collected that it didn't compute. So there we have our first computer word in the, in the Bible. There was so much grain. And as the uh, famine continued, uh, sorry, 
uh, during that time of the seven years of collecting, Joseph was simply preparing the bread by which to save the then known world from the famine to come. And as the famine continued, Joseph's family came and settled in Egypt. Through God, Joseph helped save the then known world from literal starvation. And while Joseph reigned, the nation of Israel, the Hebrews enjoyed prosperity and multiplied extensively. However, when the new Pharaoh came to the throne, it then reversed into 400 years of captivity and slavery. God then freed them through this mighty hand once again, through his mighty hand once again, for us then to witness the faithfulness of Moses. All through this account of Joseph, we have no record of any sin that he committed, unlike any other patriarchs or kings that were also faithful to God. The Bible also records that our Saviour lived a sinless life, giving us a, a wonderful example to live faithfully to the new life we have been chosen in Jesus Christ. We do not have the same excuse of a famine to blame for the lives we choose to live, no. We have food in abundance. Physically, we have food in abundance. Spiritually, we have food in abundance. Starvation is not our lot unless we choose it. Only when we unfaithfully waste our time do we starve ourselves from being nourished by the living bread of life. The living word of God is our daily food, and it's watered daily also and nourished by the Holy Spirit. The seed is the word of God that nourishes our bodies and builds us up to repentance and prepares us for life eternal. The word was flesh and dwelt among us. The word was with God, and the word is God. Brothers and sisters, today, become faithful to your calling. Recommit today. Baptismal candidates, recommit today. Commit today to the study of God's word. Our time is not what it used to be. We are running out. Jesus is coming soon. Don't starve yourselves to death by not studying his word. Feed on the life-giving word. Give yourselves anew to be faithful in everything through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Amen. So let us all now sing together, trust and obey. Please stand for this last song.
Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your Holy Spirit, Lord, that guides us and directs us on a daily basis. Father, thank you that you've taught us to trust and obey. And Lord, that we are happy in you, Father. There's a joy that's uh, unspeakable, Lord, when we know who you are. Father, and it is a joy to go and pass your love and the wonderful gift onto others, that plan of salvation that you not only have for us, but for everybody in this world. Lord, help us to empty ourselves and to be the vessels that you want us to be. Help us to be faithful in all aspects of our life, Lord. It doesn't matter how old we are or how young we are, Lord. You've taught us and given us the example all through your word of how we are to be faithful. And this we ask in your holy name. Amen.